So this chapter about animal form and function is actually a pretty quick chapter. There's not even a PowerPoint I really have um, that goes with it, but <clears throat> anyway. Um, so what this is going to be about is the diversity that you see in the anatomy of different animals across the board. And one way that you see a lot of diversity is in their physical shape. So physical shape is usually going to be related to locomotion and how fast or slow or in the water or on land something is going to be. So if you're going to be living in an aquatic environment, um, things that are going to be doing long distance swims or they need to be predatory and be fast in the water, they're going to have what's called a fusiform shape, which is going to be that they're tapered at both ends, so kind of a cigar shape, right? And um, the reason they are shaped like that is almost like a torpedo so that they can get through the water with the least amount of drag and using the least amount of energy. Now we've already talked about the fact that sharks actually have dermal denticles, which means skin teeth, and those are going to be shaped like that, and the water goes over it, and then it kind of pushes them forward, and that allows them to be a little less noisy when they're swimming, and it allows them to use less energy and go faster. Um, skeleton size is going to be a big d deal as well. Um, <clears throat> if we are talking about chitin, that's what your skeleton is made of, your exoskeleton, you're probably going to be a pretty small organism and that's just because chitin is very, very, very heavy and very brittle. So if our skeleton was made of chitin, we would barely even be able to get off the ground. We'd be laying on the ground and we wouldn't even be able to lift our heads. Plus, we would get broken bones a lot more easily. So um, if you see something that has an exoskeleton that's really huge, like I remember I was scuba diving in Cozumel, Mexico, and there was a lobster in a cave that was as big as me, gave me a heart attack. But anyway, the reason that that guy could get so big is because they're in the water and the water has buoyancy and so the weight isn't as big of a deal for them. Okay, um, <clears throat> now what we're going to get into is the way that organisms can react to their environments. So you have what are called regulators and conformers. Regulators are going to be ones that are going to, no matter what their surroundings do, they're going to have an internal chemistry, temperature, whatever it is that is specific to them and they aren't going to change that very much or fluctuate that at all based on their surroundings. Um, so the first type of regulator we have are called thermoregulators. So you can already guess what that is. Those are going to be ones that are going to um, regulate their body temperature within a certain tolerable range. So this is obviously something that we do as humans, um, as mammals right and um, there are a couple of ways that we go about doing that to make it as easy a process as possible so one thing we have is insulation right that could be in the form of having skin fur feathers oils on our feathers or our fur or having a layer of fats then you've got um, circulatory adaptations so let's say it gets really cold what we're going to do is constrict our capillaries so that we don't send all that warm blood to all of those cold parts of our body um, now on the opposite end, if we get really warm, what we'll do is vasodilation, which is where our capillaries dilate to expose that blood to as much cold around it as it can so that you can lose heat to the environment more quickly. That's why if you go jogging or something and your face turns red, it's flushing because you're vasodilating. Um, another thing that um, we can have as far, not us, but um, animals that live in the water can have is what's called a countercurrent heat exchange. And it's really interesting. So basically, let's say you've got the heart and you've got warm blood that's going out from the heart. Now, if you're talking about like a beluga whale or something that lives in the Arctic, they don't want to lose a lot of that internal heat to the environment. So they're going to have a really thick layer of blubber to insulate them. But that blood has to get out to that blubber to you know, give it circulation. So what's going to happen is you've got that warm blood that's going out to the outer parts of the body and you've got cool blood that's coming back from the outer parts of the body. And the way they're set up is you've got them right above one another and so as that cool blood comes back in, it's going to cool down this warm blood so that by the time that warm blood gets out to the rest of the body, it's already cooled down and you're not losing a lot of heat to the environment. And that warm blood, the heat from that, is going to go into that cool blood coming back so that doesn't shock the heart when it comes back and give them a heart attack. So very, very um, awesome adaptation to have. Um, another thing we can do is evaporative cooling in the form of sweating, right? So as our sweat evaporates, that makes us cool off. Um, behavioral things we can do for temperature regulation, hibernating, 
um, birds tend to migrate. Um, finding solar heat, so you know, getting out in the sun if we feel like we're really, really, really cold. Um, changing our posture, so if we stand up in the sun, we're not going to get as warm as if we lay down, right? We're not going to get as much um, exposure. And huddling, so you probably heard about how penguins do that, right? And, um, so they'll be all together and they'll huddle, and you know, that'll get them their you know body temperatures up. And they even alternate who goes on the outside, which is very, very nice, I think. Um, and then adjusting metabolic heat production. So if we get really, really cold, we involuntarily start shivering. And so those muscle twitches are basically raising our body temperature. And using brown fat is another way um, babies can actually adjust their metabolic rates. Okay. Um, then we have what's called osmoregulators, and these are going to be talking about when these organisms get exposed to salt water, fresh water, or whatever, they are going to maintain their internal chemistry regardless of what's going on around them. So um, that's basically how um, we're going to be, right? Where if we go into salt water, it's not like our body changes over. Um, but what's really cool is there are um, birds that live out in the ocean their whole life, and they never get exposed to uh, fresh water. So how do they deal with that? So they actually um, can drink salt water and then they'll either have glands on their nose where the salt crystals will come out or they um, might actually concentrate it in their urine and get rid of it that way. So pretty cool that they can actually do that. Now on the other end of this you've got conformers and conformers are going to just like it sounds they're going to conform to their environment around them. So um, You've got a couple of different types. You've got, you know, osmoconformers, and you've got, temp you know, temperature conformers, thermoconformers, and that would be like cold-blooded or something like that. <clears throat> um, so what we're all trying to do in this situation is maintain what's called homeostasis, and that's going to be our steady state. For example, homeostasis with our body, body temperature means we're about at 98.6 degrees, and we're going to have triggers and things that will keep us at that temperature. So um, there's going to be what's called a set point, and that's what I was just talking about. So 98.6 degrees is where we want our body to be. A stimulus would be any type of fluctuation. So let's say that you get a fever. That's going to be a stimulus. Or let's say that you jump in ice water and now you're going hypothermic. That's also going to be a um, a stimulus. So you're going to have sensors in your body that are going to detect that and then trigger a response. So let's say you have a fever, you might start sweating. Um, if you're really, really, really cold, you might start shivering, right? So that's going to be due to those sensors saying something's wrong, we need to get back to 98.6 degrees. Um, so there are obviously going to be times when our homeostasis is going to be altered. Um, and there are two forms that can happen. You can have what's called regulated changes. And regulated changes are going to be ones that um, just are something that evolutionarily are in us. For example, when you wake up in the morning, your body temperature is way lower than it is during the day. Um, that would be a regulated change. Um, and then the other one is acclimatizing. So when you moved up here to Denver, you probably um, were short of breath in the beginning and now you probably feel a lot better. And what you did is you acclimatized. So you actually have more red blood cells because you're living at this elevation with less oxygen, right? So that would be acclimatizing because it's not a normal thing, but when you went into this environment, your body had to adapt. Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to basically um, finish up with is going to be types of locomotion and types of skeletons organisms can have, because obviously those two are going to be related. So the first type of skeleton you can have is called a hydrostatic skeleton. So that would be like what's in an anemone or um, some types of worms. And basically they're going to have a fluid filled chamber and then they're going to pump the fluid into the chamber and that can actually change their shape. So an anemone can actually move their tentacles using their hydrostatic skeleton. Um, you can have an exoskeleton, which is obviously going to be the outside. Usually it's going to be made of chitin. And um, that's going to just be an outer on the outside of the body. And then you have an endoskeleton, which is going to be what we have, where we have our bones and everything inside our body. Um, and then the last little thing here is talking about different ways that organisms can move. Um, if we're talking about larger animals, <clears throat> Large animals are going to use what's called appendicular motion, which means that they're going to use their appendages to climb, walk, swim, or whatever it is that they do. Um, in the water, the main thing that organisms are going to be working against is not gravity, but drag from the water. And so um, they can move a whole bunch of different ways to deal with that. They can undulate, which is where they kind of go like that. They can flap their fins. Um, they can change their shape through the hydrostatic pressure that we talked about. So that's the way they can deal with that. 
Um, land animals, however, are going to be dealing with the issue of gravity. Um, there's lots of ways that they can move around, right? Walking, running, leaping, slithering, and then peristaltic moving is going to be like how an earthworm works, where it kind of gets long and then it shortens and then long and then it shortens. And then the last way they can move is flight, right? And there's basically four different types of animals that are able to fly. Birds, insects, bats, and pterosaurs, like your pterodactyl, which are obviously extinct. So those are going to be the differences when you look at kind of a grand picture of um, their anatomy and little differences here and there. In um, the next chapter, we're actually going to get into um, more physiological differences between them.